Early in the year, Fantasy Flight Games announced Keyforge, a groundbreaking new way of approaching a trading card game. Designed by Richard Garfield, a man whose humble list of design credits includes Magic the Gathering, Netrunner, and others. As soon as I saw the announcement, I knew that this could actually rival Magic, the unshaken king monolith of DCGs, if not in numbers, then at least in spirit, because it embraced exactly what the others refused to do. No longer do you have to build your deck or obsess over the meta or hunt down expensive cards. Instead, you just buy a deck and it's yours and it's one of a kind and unique and no other deck like this exists in this world. And that's brilliant. I think that's exactly what trading card games needed. It sheds elitism and embraces ownership and ownership is such an important part of this very physical hobby. And I can see Keyforge communities being so much nicer places than Magic's had ever been, a game that went up its own butt via the root of the pro scene. But if that wasn't enough, Fantasy Flight Games then announced that this was not the only unique game. And that second one, unlike Keyforge, was a board game. A board game where each box is once again unique, an adventure that only you will experience. And if you bought a second copy, it is entirely likely that your adventure will be different. It is a concept that is invigoratingly innovative, stupendously astounding, lavishly luscious, brazenly beautiful, captivatingly capricious, magnificently meticulous and meticulously magnificent, courageously creative, drop dead, dastardly different, stupefyingly, staggeringly, salaciously, surreptitiously splendid, gobsmackingly and bum spankingly gorgeous, blow Sally a kiss and accidentally call her Vivian Bodacious. It's fresh, it's feisty, it's dri Drippingly dazzling and spicy, it's all about exploring and not at all about things that are boring like Steve adoring or carpet flooring, it's zesty, it's cool, it's as the kids say, on fleece, and it is right here, on our table, and you know what? It's no good. I can hear some of you saying, I knew it. Sweet sugar alternative. I knew it. A procedurally generated board game box with a narrative. How was that ever going to be good? Strangely, and this is ultimately the reason why we decided to cover Discover Lands Unknown, is that the unique nature is not at all this game's downfall. And now that we have you hooked, we can tango back a bit, give you a broader vision, if you will. Each box of Discover Lands Unknown will take you on a wilderness survival adventure. Upon Fantasy Flight's insistence, we will try and spoil very little, including showing you only one of six possible terrain types provided to us separately in this demonstration kit for visual purposes, hence the flimsy cardboard. For clarification, our review is based on an actual copy of the game, plus an additional play with an entirely separate copy. And initially, things look good. You'll set up your map based on a scenario, read some story to get you in the mood for a sexy exploration, and you'll head off on your adventure. Each player will receive a choice of two beautifully illustrated characters, and I cannot overemphasize enough what a fantastic job has been done here. Not only is the roster diverse, with playable characters from many conceivable backgrounds, but the art direction is superb, adding a touch of whimsy and bringing these people to life making you feel a connection with them. I wanted to take these people on an adventure because I wanted to find out what happened to them. I wanted them to succeed. Fortunately, taking them on that adventure is a simple matter. Each player gets a cardboard dial to track your stamina and wounds. When your turn comes around, you'll start on a campfire and you can spend stamina to do things. Want to go somewhere? That's one stamina. Want to move through dense forest? That's two stamina. Immediately you'll notice that most of the map is unexplored, so you'll trot off to the edge of a tile. Spend one stamina and flip it to reveal Luton. Can we leave? Um, it says here that no. Believe it or not, Luton is the perfect analogy because all we find here is some rocks, perhaps a dying fish and an old ruin. But that's okay because we can make the best out of this situation. Collected resources can be used to craft items and crafting in this game is lovely. Each player is given a card to craft, which could be a weapon giving you coveted rerolls in fights, or perhaps something more esoteric, like a fish trap. But no matter what you get, it's going to be useful somehow, even if it's not immediately clear why. In fact, if you haven't played the game before, it is not 
obvious what the item actually does until you make it, leaving it as a nice surprise. Once you do make the item, however, the schematics go into a shared pool and now everyone can make their thing. This is so nice because it actually incentivizes you to help other players by giving them resources. Actually, it works the same in real life. I've crafted this lovely cup out of a cardboard canyon and now you can too. Why would I want to make that? Because you can have a lovely cup of milk and milk comes from cows. Talking of cows, this resource that we just picked up turned out to be a cow. Now, if you were to ask us what is NPI's official stance on animals, we'd be pleased to tell you that we love them very much and are generally very fond of them. But if you were to ask us what NPI's official stance on cows is, then we would be obligated to tell you that we find them morally reprehensible and wouldn't give two thoughts about turning them into a steak. Fortunately, according to the rules of the game, you are now forced to kill it. Like everything, fighting in this game is straightforward. Each opponent has a grey value and a red value. And every time you fight, you'll roll both the red and the grey dice. Roll equal or above the grey and you deal them a wound. Roll below the red value and you'll take a wound. And wounds are bad because any four will eliminate you from the game. Once you're out of stamina or just decide that enough is enough, you'll pass your turn. And once every player has had a go, one player will draw a night card and apply its effects to everyone. This is also how you get stamina. And if you haven't spent all your stamina, you can save up for a big next turn. You're also likely to need food or water or both. And if you don't have them, you will take a wound. And remember four wounds and you die, you're out of the game. But just you, not everyone else, they you get to carry on playing while you go off and make a cup of tea or maybe manage the evening Spotify playlist, totally being young and hip and pretending you know who Cardi B Jepsen is. One of my favourite rules in this game is that if you are near another player who is fighting, you can assist them. It doesn't cost you anything to help, you just pitch one of your free combat cards. But the disadvantage is that if they get injured, for example, you could get injured too. In that way, assisting becomes an interesting proposition because you want other players to succeed, but there is a real sense of risk if you do. Sadly, that's the only thing that's interesting about combat because not only is it obviously simplistic and too reliant on luck, but it's also tedious. Let's say I scored a hit against that cow. Great! However, it's not dead because it needs free wounds. Can I keep fighting it? No, because in its infinite idiocy, the cow will just wander off in a random direction, forcing you to persistently and laboriously follow it in vain attempts to try and hit a slow moving object that is three times the size of you. It's not the sort of bad design that I mind because thus begins the multiple round spanning epic story of my bovine hunting foibles. And that's funny, but I'm telling you right now, that's just about the funniest thing that happens in this game. And remember these characters, these heavenly creatures whose fate lies in your hands. Nothing, nothing is as disappointing as when their story goes nowhere. Yeah, a sushi chef doesn't have to cook meat for it to be edible and that makes sense until you kill a chicken and then that's salmonella anyway you slice it and so that doesn't make sense. But the real problem is that the story is as thin and as fishy as a sad fish whisper. Each scenario starts with a story card that won't tell you how you got here, but at least will tell you what you need to do to get out. This might be investigating a certain location, gathering a bunch of a resource, etc. Once you do, a new plot card will be revealed and some have particularly nasty surprises. This way you'll get through two or at most four before you reach a conclusion. Our game was a particularly contrived affair with certain heavy riffing on an 80s cult movie. Was it the Egghead starring Dan Aykroyd? No. Okay, was it 16 Candles? You were there playing it with me. Right, no, yeah. It was with Nell and I. Each time you investigate a numbered location, something exciting will happen, although, mark my words, excitement is not guaranteed. You'll draw the appropriately numbered card from the exploration deck, reveal it, and then you'll either get a new item or perhaps advance the plot, or maybe it'll say something like, if you only had the thing that would thing the thing, then you could thing the thing, the board game equivalent of you are not ready yet, come back later. And once you have found the key that unlocks the door, the hatchet that chops down 
the hatch, you will be allowed to, instead of looking at that same numbered card, to dig down a few cards deeper, upon which secrets will be revealed. I think this is Discover Lands Unknown at its most interesting. You have objectives, you have mysterious locations to explore, but also there's a story objective to advance, but also there's food to gather and water to find, because you need those every night, and then there's monsters to find, and there's a lot of distance between all of them, and you'll have to move back and forth, and you'll be aching over which one to do first, because you need to advance the plot, because if you don't advance the plot, then you'll die, but you also need food, and if you don't get food, you'll also die. And last time I heard, dying is a bit poo. But I have to admit that it all feels slightly artificial. The interesting part of the game is definitely the investigation, but at times we got the distinct impression that all that survival malarkey is just there to pad it out. I never felt rewarded when I killed an ostrich, I was just glad that I was done with that part of the game, and then could move on to something else. And at other times, it felt arbitrary. One of the major unspoken objectives in most scenarios is finding water. There's often maybe a single reliable source of it on the map, and you could play a game where the distance between it and a focal point of the scenario spends multiple turns getting across. Or you could play the same scenario again, and because of the semi-random distribution of tiles, it could end up right next to it. Because water is so important, it is entirely likely that in this scenario, one of you will be designated the water mule, and then you'll be lugging water back and forth across the map, and wouldn't that be fun to do for about an hour? Not to mention that it could have made the scenario so difficult that you likely lost anyway. We have to admit that we've deceived you just a little bit. No, we don't think it's the unique nature of the game that makes it a very mediocre experience, but it does have some hiccups which certainly don't help. Each scenario will tell you which story cards to use, except our copy was missing about five of them, and we were certain they were missing because we were told to use cards one to 60, with some cards in between potentially not being present, but the cards we were missing were 56 to 60, and surely if they'd meant to do this, if this was on purpose, we would have been told to put in cards 1 to 55 instead. And sure enough, as we played the game, we were told to look at cards 57, 58, and of course we couldn't. And with this being unique, we weren't even sure if we could file a missing parts request, making our copy just a bit duff. But that's just a sticking point, and the real crap kernel is that this game is semi-cooperative, a genre often disliked because mostly it doesn't work. But instead of telling you why ourselves, in a unique twist for NPI and with kind permission from Mr. Vassal, we are including a clip from the Dice Tower's review of Discover Lands Unknown. Trust us, there is a point to all of this. But the biggest part of this game that I did not like was at the end of scenario one. So this is a bit of a spoiler, but I don't care. So then in scenario one, you had to do something. I won't explain exactly what was going on. I'll try to be as nebulous as possible, but you had to beat a boss, right? Okay, fine. So we're playing our first game. So Sam went up and he's fighting this boss and I'm like, all right, I'll help you. So I come in and I play cards to help him and he, he wins. It was a fierce battle, but he wins. Okay, fierce by a few lucky rolls of the dice. He wins, great. Do you know what happens? Sam wins the game. Me and the other players still have to win the game on our own. That guy that he beat came back to life. We have to fight him again or else we lose and only Sam wins. Wait a minute, why did I bother even helping him? What kind of weird sadistic trick is this? Even Sam wasn't satisfied with that outcome because from now on, we're never gonna help each other. That, I, I, I'm still mind boggled that that even existed in this game. As you might have guessed, the exact same thing happened to us, almost verbatim, except that it happened in scenario three instead of one. And our reaction was identical. No one round the table wanted to play anymore. We quit in unison. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because now I'm not even sure about the unique nature of this game. If two reviewers just happen to have the same story, Imagine playing through this, getting another copy, and the story being just the same. Imagine how disappointing that would be. Even when it's not so annoying that it makes you want to quit, the semi-co-op part is suspect at best. And that's really the sad part, because I get what they were going for. Some narrative-driven games 
want to tell story via text on cards, whereas others want the story emerge via mechanisms and the situations they create. Discover Lands Unknown wants to have its cherry pie and eat it, but then on top it wants to experiment with funky ingredients like sauerkraut. Actually, hang on just a second. All right, should be ready by now. This could be actually something really good because there's a layer of cherries here, but also, as you can see, a layer of sauerkraut. And if this takes off, I mean, I'm not joking. I could be a millionaire. So best of luck. Yep, I think I'm gonna go back to board game reviews. I think the idea is that if each player is forced to play for themselves, but the game is so hard that they can't actually win unless they cooperate, then it inevitably thrusts them into uncomfortable situations. For example, my friend Herbert here could win the game, but he'll die if he don't get some food. Now, I have that food and I could bring it over to him, but I am inclined to go in the opposite direction and get some water for myself because I am dying of thirst. And this is a classic Sophie's choice. I could go and get him the food and help the others win the game, but then I myself would lose because according to the rules, only the people alive at the end are winners. Or you could go and get the water, wait for Herbert to die, loot his corpse, and then try and survive and win on your own. And that might sound like an interesting decision, but I'm telling you right now, it's not. What the game is effectively asking you is, do you want to be an asshole to your friends? And the answer on our table was always no, because we started playing this game cooperatively from the get-go, because that's what it initially wanted us to do. So I'll be frank with you, I don't think I'd actually want to play this game with people on whose table the answer would be different, because this game is hard work, and after about 90 minutes, of that hard work, dying doesn't feel great, especially when it's because of your friends. And I can hear some of you saying, but wait a minute, I love semi-cooperative games. What about Dead of Winter? What about Battlestar Galactica? What about New Angeles maybe even? And I'll tell you what, stick with them because those games work so much better. Talking of similar games, obvious parallels will be drawn between this and Seventh Continent, which we've covered separately. But if you need a catch up, it's kind of like Discover, but drawn out over a 30 hour experience with the highs being much higher and the lows being equally as dull. In hindsight, Seventh Continent is a better game, but still not one we would recommend. If you've never watched one of our videos before and you've got this far, know that we are nearly never this negative and it doesn't feel great picking this game apart, especially knowing how much hard work went into it by talented artists or by designers whose name appears in the credits of our second most favorite game. No one set out to make discover lands unknown a bad experience. The opposite, it's brave and it tries and it succeeds in being different. And I sincerely hope that the elements that did work like the art or the simple but robust system carry over into wherever they take this next. And experimenting is great and it's important, but not when it's such a flop. And there is no reason why you should pay for this flop with your wallet. Nope, still not good. 